What's up, dudes? Yo, what's up, dudes? <laughs> How's it going? So this will be day one of, um, I, I, you know, I, I actually went through and looked through all my pictures and uh, my footage, and I think I got three three days worth of stuff. And just to clarify for those who maybe misunderstood my last video when I talk about didn't get a lot of footage, I took a bunch of stills, and I think one guy wrote, well, yeah, well, I never saw any of the stills because I'm not on Facebook. And I'm like, well, then this is perfect because you won't have seen this material before. I think what I was saying was is that... Um, if you were following on Facebook, you know, it's going to be like 60% filler <laughs> on this because you've seen a lot of these photos before. But uh, if you haven't seen anything on Facebook, then this is all going to be brand new because um, that's what I got. I got stills. So uh, we, I flew out on a Wednesday. Of course, like last year, I had a blizzard the night before. This year, they were actually going to have snow like the next day. Uh, so I, you know, made it out in time. I was a little getting a little worried about flying out. If you've ever been in a plane that was de-iced, it's not a good feeling <laughs> to watch them spray it down. They first spray it down with a hot gel that melts everything, and then they spray it down with an antifreeze, which is a different color. So the, the hot gel is like red, and then the antifreeze is like green. And once you're fully coated green, you're cleared to take off. And I, I got to tell you, it's not a good feeling. It's not a good feeling to get de-iced before you take off. So luckily, we didn't have to deal with any of that. Took the train into the city. A couple people, I think, recognized Reedville Station there. I'm on the South Shore, so uh, I think I was on the, the Franklin line, and uh, take that in. And um, then got into the airport, it was easy peasy, it wasn't nearly as chaotic as it was last year. Last year I went down to my gate, and again, they had the gate wrong. <laughs> they always have the gate wrong. So my, you know, I printed out my ticket, and I printed out my ticket like an hour before I left, so... And they still had the wrong gate. So I was like, all right, well, I'll, I'll figure it out. But uh, I, I got to the right gate. I was able to get through, no problem. And, you know, I'm one of those guys that when I fly, I can't stand the aisle or the middle seat. I want the window. I get in there. I nest. I never get up. I never move. I sleep for some of the time. Uh, this time uh, when I went out there... Um, we had Wi-Fi, so I was on, that's right, on the on the flight out, we had Wi-Fi. And we had Wi-Fi on the whole flight. It was freaking awesome. We hit a couple of um, blank patches as we were flying through, but for the most part, we, I had, we had Wi-Fi for like 95% of the flight, which was sweet. So I was on my phone like the whole time, checking things out, blah, 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 and planning my stuff. Um, once again, we land, and once again, and I swear it's the night driver because the day driver was so much better. We had the super shuttle van from hell. My God, this dude just driving so fast. One thing I will give him, though, is that when we took that exit, we took the same exit to get out to Anaheim that's 25 miles an hour. This guy slowed way down. He was doing 80 until we got to that exit, weaving in and out of traffic. You know, I mean, the van is like going all over the place. It's full of people. It's like, really? Really? And uh, we, we, you know, we get out there, and uh, he did take the exit at, at about 30, 25, 30. Last year, the guy took it at, like, 45. He was looking down at, like, his little tablet. Oh, shit, I'm on an exit. You know, it was like, you've got to be kidding me. This, this year, the, the guy was a little bit better, but, but not much. The guy on the ride back was awesome, and then, which is why he got a good tip. And the guy on the, ride out, on the ride out got nothing. It's the way it works, bro. So uh, get out there day one. <clears throat> the traffic on day one was so insane. The guys I was meeting there were like a half hour late for showing up. And they were supposed to be there at like, you know, 9, 9.30. They left like an hour early to make sure they would get there to do some last minute, you know, touches to their booth. And uh, they didn't get there to like 20 after 10. That's how crazy ballistic the traffic was. They literally got out and walked up 
some of them, well, the other ones were waiting to park. That's how crazy the, it was crazy. <laughs> it's so crazy. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, so I walked to the convention center. I, my hotel was close enough. It was only a couple of blocks away. It looked bigger on the map as I was walking it. I was like, wow, I'm re this is really not that far away. It's really close. So I went uh, right down to the convention center, and um, you know, it's it's like at, at a, it's at this like sort of horizontal angle that you could go down sort of the main road, but I went sort of down this like end road where my hotel was, and boom, I was right to the stadium side of the convention center. Went in, got my badge. You know, how do you got to go through it? It's a hundred dollars if you lose the badge. Now, a lot of people are like, geez, that sounds crazy, but people were selling them right to the public. That's what. That's why that is like that. People will take the badge outside, sell it, go back and say, oh, I lost my badge, and get another free badge and be making money, right? Even if the badge was twenty dollars uh, to get replaced, people were selling them outside for fifty to get in the the building. So they made it a hundred dollars, and that put a you know, a squash down on that. And uh, they made you show photo ID to get in. So without a photo ID, I mean, you have to be really desperate to get in if you don't think you can get in to NAM, uh, And you need a fake photo ID and all that stuff. It, it'd be, that'd be pretty pathetic uh, because you can get into NAM. You just have to either know somebody or just sign up for like a press pass and you can get in. So I walked down there, I walked by this crazy Lincoln that was like all hydraulic up. We were calling it the official NAM limo. And, uh, you know, they had the palm trees, which, you know, I come from an area there's no palm trees. Palm trees? It's like nothing like that where I live. Um, so, you know, that's always sort of cool to see. And you forget just how tall they are. They're really big. They're enormous. Um Again, we don't have, I mean, we do have trees like that in Massachusetts, but there are, you know, you know, your standard spread out oak. You don't see a giant trunk like that, you know. Um, because I got in so early, the place was empty, and you can re that's the time to take photos because you're not fighting with, you know, thousands and thousands of other people. So as I was walking through, I found the Wall of Marshalls. I got a great photo of the Wall of Marshalls. Um, again, because the place was empty, right? That makes all the difference. And, uh, and then I made a beeline right for the Ibanez booth because I knew they were coming out with the new Paul Stanleys and I wanted to be one of the first people to post pictures of it from like actually from the floor. And uh, I did. I made a beeline right down there. I got a picture of them. Now, take a look at those MSRPs. <laughs> you know, the, these aren't for the faint of heart. I think that mirrored one is, you know, closing in on ten grand, And I think the... Um, uh, the other ones are actually pretty expensive too. And, you know, very quickly they go to Indonesia and then to, I think, China for the, for the least expensive one. Uh, that could be Indonesia, uh, to be honest. I don't know, but I know that their premium is Indonesia. That's their sort of midline. And then they have a lower rung and I believe that's China. I could be wrong, but, um, my guess is, is that the, the $800 one, the one that has a list of like 799 is, is probably Indonesian. They also had uh, these new Satriani guitars that were very interesting. Uh, again, very expensive uh, MSRPs. You know, you're talking you know seven, eight, nine grand. Um, but they were uh, sort of uh, artwork. I'm assuming Joe's artwork. And uh, uh, those looked uh, pretty cool. Um, uh, again, nothing, nothing, no new technology. It's really all in the packaging. Um, but if you know, if you're a big fan of Satriani and you want those limited edition guitars, uh, there they are. And then they had uh, some new gems, including a new Indonesian-made gem, uh, the new premium line. Again, to try to bring uh, the the price of the instrument uh, way down. Um, <clears throat> I think personally, I would. I would prefer to try and find a used Japanese one. I think those new Indonesian ones are good. I do think the old Japanese ones are a little nicer. And, you know, it, it, once you factor in the used end of it, where, you know, the, the guitars come down a little bit in price, just the mere fact that it's secondhand, um, it, they, they probably line up, re, re, you know, relatively the same. The... Um, that new uh, gem was not inexpensive. It was like a $2,300 list, if I remember correctly, which is, you know, that's pricey for an Indonesian guitar. I mean, my <clears throat> my Squire Stratocaster is made in Indonesia, you know, and that's got, that sells for, 
uh, 249. I bought, I paid 179 for it. So Indonesian guitars, granted, they're different factories. It's a different standard. You know, clearly, you know, there can be different levels. But I'm saying that you're not going to find a $179 American-made guitar, a Japanese-made guitar. That's kind of hard. Um, so when you get to Indonesia and you can get a guitar that cheap, it's hard to market a more expensive guitar out of the region. It's like trying to market a very high-end Chinese guitar. It's kind of hard to do right now. It'll take time. I'm not saying it won't get there, but uh, the Japanese went through this when we first went to Japan. You know, Japanese was always considered, well, it'll never be good as American. I would say they're as good as American, if not better, uh, in some instances. Uh, Japan really came into their own in terms of their manufacturing. And, um, and now I think Indonesia is sort of the next in line to be sort of the premium brand, whereas, um, you know, China's taken up the bottom end at this point. It was a, a Korea, but uh, Korea, I don't know what's going on with Korea right now. They seem to be transitioning to a more premium line, if you, if, from what I can see. Um, left there, I went to the Gibson booth because I wanted to see the new Satchel guitar, and sure enough, they had the new Satchel guitar out there. Uh, looked pretty cool. Uh, I was able to get a, a close uh, pick of the specs, and if you take a look at the specs, you can see it's got an extra thin taper neck on it. And so I tried both the Satchel and just the new Kramers. They had uh, a couple of new uh, Kramers there. The Satchel one had a definitely a, a thinner neck, especially around the nut area. I don't know that it was much thinner up around the 12th and 15th frets, but certainly down around the 1st, the 3rd, you know, frets 1 to 3, it was absolutely thinner. And uh, I really liked it. It was a, a really nice uh, feeling guitar. I I wish they made one in a little maybe a little bit more subtle uh, design. I like that neck, but maybe not on that body. Um, as much as I love hair metal, you know, th this was hair metal back in 1983. This is an '83 Kramer. This is what that guitar is actually made, you know, based upon. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of cool. Went over and checked out the Les Pauls and the SGs. Um, once again, I was, you know, the Les Pauls, they have me scratching my head because, um, you know, some people like a big neck and some people like a thinner neck. I like the thinner neck. I know a lot of people that like a bigger neck, but it seems like all the new Les Pauls are using this sort of 50 style bigger neck. And it just sort of, you know, crowds out uh, those of us who like a, who like a, a, a thinner neck. So I, I was trying guitar after guitar, and I was like, geez, are they not making the 60s profile anymore? And if they are, I just, you know, there were a lot of guitars there. I only tried a, a small sample of them. I didn't really try every one that was on the shelf, so maybe they still do make the 60s neck. But the one I tried, all of them were pretty hefty. They were like baseball bats. I was like, wow, I don't think I could get used to this. This is a really big neck. The SGs were a little smaller, but not that much smaller, <laughs> you know. They were still pretty hefty, I thought, for, uh, you know, a modern guitar. I always thought that the goal was to make necks, you know, easier to play and a little bit smaller, but I suppose there is a diminishing return after a certain point. And Gibson seems, that their customers must be telling them they like the bigger necks. Maybe they looked at their metrics and said, you know what, the 50s profile outsells the 60s profile, and we'll go with that. I don't know. But um, that was definitely what was going on in the Gibson booth. Left Gibson, went over to my favorite booth. <laughs> it's these guys are, you know, they're so bad, they're good, right? <laughs> they're like the Predator 2 of electric guitars. And that's ESP. So uh, they had their custom shop guitars out there. Uh, I think they were all, all the guitars that were out there. I'm not really sure of the sort of the intricate puzzle one that was up front. Um that one made, I didn't really see a price, but a lot of them were listed at $75,000, which, you know, I'm going to, I'm just going to come right out and I'm going to take a hard stance and say, you know, that's kind of a lot for a guitar. That's just me though. 75,000, even 7,500, I think is a lot for a guitar. I, uh, I think $750 is a lot for a guitar, but you know, we can argue about that. 75,000. I think we can sort of all agree on that one. I think that could be a point of us all joining together and say, yeah, 75000 That's kind of pricey. But, you know, I think they price them that way because, um, well, it really, 
right? That's that's half of the marketing, right? Um, there's a great scene in uh, Flaming Moe's, right, when Homer comes up with a drink and steals it, and Moe steals it, and it, it completely turns his bar around, and he becomes famous for this drink, a drink that he stole from Homer. And so, you know, Homer says, you know, I can't believe you stole my drink. And the waitress goes, wait, you stole his drink? He says, well, he might have come up with the formula, but I came up with the idea to charge $15 for it. <laughs> right? I mean, that's so perfect. Because really, coming up with a price, a high price, is half the battle. And uh, so, uh, you know, those were interesting. They clearly were very intricate, very odd. They also had some really cool flame top and quilt top guitars that I thought looked really good. A lot of those were already sold uh, right off the floor. And then, of course, they had their regular stock, all their standard, you know, artist endorsed guitars and the like. Um, and then, because the the show had just opened, it started getting crowded, and I, I, I wound up uh, getting out of there and then heading over to my buddy's booth to see if they had finally shown up, and they were there. And uh, so I said hi to them. They have the U.S. Blues picks. Uh, I'm actually playing one right now. It's made out of uh, a... Um, this is, is this bone or horn? It's either bone or horn. Jeez, oh, I forget now. I think that's horn. Yeah, and that's horn. It's a white horn, and that's like a black horn right there. And they, they make them out of all kinds of different things. The the material I thought was really interesting was the organic ivory. I've got I'm going to do a whole video on those because um, you know it's an exciting sort of alternative to ivory. Uh, I don't know that anyone was claiming for an ivory pick, but. Um, I do know that they feel great. They have a nice stiffness to them. They don't wear out as fast as the horn uh, or the bone, and um, they're made out of vegetables, like a like a like a treated nut. They make it out of a nut that they you know treat somehow and 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 turn it into this uh, pick. That it, it, it's pretty amazing actually. Um, and they 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 come standard, plain, or they they come in um, you know different uh, dyes. Uh, so they, you know, they look cool as well as sound and play cool. So it's pretty uh, interesting stuff. So after I saw them, uh, right next door to their booth was um, Studio Devil. I don't know if you're familiar with Studio Devil. I'm actually going through, I'm going through a demo right now. So they said to uh, talk to them. I already sent them an email. Uh, they might get me a copy of uh, Studio Pro and uh, whatever the software that they're using there. And uh, I said, you know, I'd love to check it out. Um, I, you know, I definitely love this. I think it sounds actually uh, really good. So um, I was talking to them. They actually had a new uh, pedal. By uh, they, they partnered up with the people who make Atomic pedals. And they came out with the amplifier, which I thought was a brilliant, you know, pun on amplifier. So uh, <laughs> the amplifier pedal is, of course, powered by Studio Devil technology, and it's you know this little like um, like little mini um, amp pedal. And uh, they were doing a demo of it at the uh, at the booth, and I I definitely caught some footage for that for, uh, from that, and I think I have that right here. I'll have to find out that dude's name. I, I'll do more footage of that uh, later because I think I, I captured another performance a little later. So I'll take a look and, and we can we can check that out. Uh, I went down to see Orange Jam, snapped a couple of pics. Uh, their new thing was like the Orange Crush. So there wasn't anything I hadn't already heard about there. Uh, right next door was Dan Electro Guitars. Uh, they have a really cool vintage vibe. And I, I got to say, I, I kind of do like the sparkle. It's, it's so gaudy. It's awesome, you know. Um, a little ways down from that was Carvin Guitars. 
Uh, I really like Carvin. They, um, they're sort of a, a really nice uh, handmade premium product made right here in the USA. And um, they, ju they just make a couple of guitars that I, I just really, really like. I really like their, their woods. They have these cool flame tops and, you know, other items, uh, you know, uh, like, um, like spalted maple and uh, um, what's the other one? Quilted maple. And they just, you know, they, they know how to use the wood. I really like, the, you know, their, their, their stuff. It, it's really cool. And don't, you know, of course, their amps are legendary, too. Uh, got out of there, went up to Godin Guitars. Um, there's something about some of those Godin, uh, like, nylon acoustics that I really love. Um, but I was checking out a couple of the electrics. It was so crowded in there, I really couldn't get many picks. So I left there, and I remembered that um, Rabia um, Masad, Rabia um I, I can never, is it Rabia or Rabir? I think they would say like Rabir. But of course, then they say Rabia. <laughs> I feel like I'm, my Boston accent's cre creeping back in again. Uh, so I went down to see Panama Amps, and who was there but Fluff and um, uh, Garrett uh, Peters. So uh, I saw uh, Ryan Bruce and said hello to him, and I met Garrett Peters, who was a super nice guy. And we wound up taking a photo to, uh, together, which we uh, threw up on uh, Facebook, and a lot of people really seem to love that photo. And uh, I was checking out Panama Amps a little bit. Um, I didn't really get any, uh, there'll be a million demos out there because they're really, you know, making a push on social media. But um, I, I really thought the idea of putting an attenuator in the cab, right, so you can crank the amp up and then crank the sound down a little bit was kind of smart, kind of brilliant. I was like, you know, that's actually pretty cool. So um, it'd be interesting to see how those, I know Fluff got a, a demo, so we should be seeing, you know, some, um, uh, you know, some footage on that coming out on, on social media, um, on YouTube and Facebook uh, pretty regularly, very soon. So um, we were there, and I think Robert Baker came by, and we were talking to him for a little bit. Geez, we just sort of were having a blast, and we, we went over, um, uh, Garrett wanted to bring us over to the, the Engel booth, because he does work with Engel, and we were like, sure, and he said that Steve Morse was playing there, he was like, let's go see if we can catch Steve Morse before he's, he's done, and we were like, absolutely, love Steve Morse, uh, and on the way over, we went by Mike Stern, of all people, and you know, he needed a crowd around, I could not believe that people didn't recognize Mike Stern. He's such, such an amazing player. He's really, really worth checking out, Mike Stern. So we left there. We went over to the Engel booth, and uh, that was cool because it had the Steve Morse guitar was still there. He had just finished. We missed him, but he had just played the guitar, and, of course, <laughs> you know, Garrett and Robert and myself were all like, let's, you know, let's lay our hands on that guitar and see if we can... See if we can, you know, breathe in a little bit of the, the awesomeness of Steve Morse. Did, didn't help me, but <laughs> uh, we were having a lot of fun. So uh, so we, we were tired. We may have already got some lunch at that point, and we said, you know what, let's, um, we went out to the truck, as we always do, and uh, we went back inside, and we, were, we went upstairs to, sort of sit down, take a load up, because there's no seating out. There is seating, but it's all taken up. So, you know, we've been standing and standing and standing in line and standing and eating and all this. It's like, I got to go sit down. And uh, so we went up to the second floor because I knew they had some seating up there. We found one seat that was open, and we were sort of sharing it. And who come around the corner but Glenn from uh, Spectre Sound Studios. What's up, dudes? And uh, we had a sort of a funny interplay with him. And, uh, boy, he's a hot shit, you know. He's a funny guy. So <laughs> we, were, we were having fun. I, I was shooting the breeze with, uh, with Glenn, Glenny, Glenn, for a little bit. And um, I think I shot a little promo with him uh, for his channel. And then uh, I really wanted to go to the Duncan booth. And I think uh, the other guys had said they wanted to go to Duncan or... Maybe that was later, but I, I know at that point I was making my way over to the Duncan booth. And uh, who was there but Mary Chella, Mary Sella Juarez. Um, 
who wound, no, not, not these pickups, uh, in my Ibanez right there. She wound those pickups. Uh, she's like the most famous winder of all from Seymour Duncan, legendary. And um, I have a, a, a few pickups wound by her and because uh, I'm old enough, right? <laughs> but you bought pickups from Seymour Duncan in the 1980s. They were most likely wound by her. And uh, so I was able to get a picture with her, total legend. She just heads up the custom shop now. Um, from there, um, we went outside. Of course, they get the whole place lit up. They get a stage going. They get a band going. They get the fountain going. And uh, we're heading over to the PV 50th um, anniversary uh, celebration at, I believe it was the Hilton. And um, they have uh, Leonard Skinner is going to play, and the opening band is Blue Oyster Cult. So I was like, sweet, that, that sounds awesome. But we got there, and oh my God, they made us sit through. They took, you know, they opened the doors at 6. They didn't start talking until 7. They talked for like an hour. Don't forget, we had been standing and standing. People are dying. I mean, we're rocking back and forth. I'm going, I, I mean, it, it, we were just dying. Everyone was dying from standing. Now, there was a whole section where they had tables, but I had been to some of those events before where, yeah, some have tables, and then there's like an area for the press, but then it's seating beyond that. It wasn't just standing room, and this was all standing room. So we're dying. We're getting beers. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, we're sitting there. We're, we're standing there. We're drinking. And uh, we're hearing, you know, one awesome story after another about how awesome Hartley Peavy is. And he is. I'm not saying he's not. I'm just saying we're dying. It's like, <laughs> I'm going free, bird. <laughs> so Blue Earth the Cult came out with Rudy Sarzo on bass. And uh, they actually sounded pretty good. They were a little rough at first, but then the mix came in and their playing sort of warmed up. And, uh, you know, I'm... How many times can you watch Rudy Sarzo like lick his fingers and play over the top? But he was, uh, you know, they, he's a showman. They, they were, yeah. And I ran into him. He was out in the show a couple of times. I remember seeing Randy, uh, Rudy. And then um, they did all their hits. They, you know, they played like five songs or four songs, and everyone was a song you knew. You know, they did uh, with Rock and Roll and Don't Fear the Reaper and... Uh, you know, uh, Godzilla, and, um, you know, they just, they were, they were awesome. And uh, so they were, and I was like, well, this is, this bodes well, because I bet Skinner's going to sound great. So Skinner comes out, and um, they've got a little guy named Michael Anthony playing bass, who sounds amazing. First of all, I liked his bass sound much better than Rudy Sarzo's. And secondly, uh, you forget how awesome a singer Michael Anthony is. Michael Anthony can sing his ass off. And he was doing those harmony parts with them on those Skinner tunes, and he sounded amazing. He was so amazing. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, this is crazy. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, we're, 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 you know, waiting for Skinner to like blow us away. And they, you know, they sounded good, but I got to say, BOC sounded better. And um, there was a, they couldn't quite get their sound and their act together as quickly as BOC did. So I, I don't know what was going on, but, um, you know, it was a little rougher. But I, I, I was sticking around because I thought Michael Anthony sounded so great. And uh, they had, um, what's his name? Is it Robbie? Is it Robert? He plays the stand-up um, pedal steel. I, oh, my God, it's, it's killing me. Robert Townsend? No. What's the guy who stands up? My oh God, I can't think of it. Anyway, Robert Townsend's like an actor. It's like, I, I'm getting all confused here, but you know what, who I'm talking about. The guy who stands up, and he, 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 uh, he has a pedal steel that he usually drapes over his shoulder. It's not a pedal steel. He's not working pedals. Sometimes he sits, but this is he's standing up. He's playing like a lap steel that's, that's hanging out. And he sounded incredible, and he, and of course, for the, all the slide stuff for Skinner, it, it worked perfectly. And um, you know, he's such a killer blues player and a country player. It really, really, you know, worked well together. And uh, but about, I don't know, so far into like their set, 
I, I couldn't stand up anymore. And my battery on my phone was down to like 3%. And I was like, you know what? I'm out. <laughs> and I, we were all the way up the front. We got there so early. We were right up front. I got out of there. I said, guys, I'll be out in the lobby. I went out in the lobby. And sure enough, you know, every so many poles, one of the poles has a little outlet on it for the vacuum cleaner, right? So the people can go and vacuum the floor, whatever they need it for. And so uh, I just <laughs> plugged my, I happened to have my charger with me. Right? So you do, you bring your charger with you. And uh, I plugged my phone right in and I just sat there and I might have been sitting there for two or three minutes and all of a sudden the doors opened up. I must have left halfway through the last song <laughs> because I wasn't out there all of like just a few minutes and the doors, it's like I missed almost nothing of the show. They really must have done a short, a very, very short set. I couldn't believe it. I think they did the rest of the song I was listening to and then Ain't Talking About Love and it was over. And I was like, wow, I wish I saw Ain't Talking About Love, but you know, uh, they told me it was odd. <laughs> I said, I, be I bet it was. So that was it. Uh, that was, the, we were all starving and, um, we, we finished up the night by going to this, uh, pizza joint, which I'll admit from the outside really looked like a dump. I was like, oh, this, this better be like the world's greatest pizza. And you know what? It really was amazing pizza. It was really, really good. And, and they had 285 beers to choose from. And they had a, the beer curator was on staff. So he was coming there and he was like offering all kinds of crazy suggestions. You know, oh, if I think if you like that, you might want to try this and blah, blah, blah. And he was really, really good. So the night ended really well. Um, I was beat. And, uh, but, you know, I was pretty happy with my first day. So that was day one of my Nam Odyssey. <laughs> and I will be back. With days two and three, as time permits. And until then, as always, rock on.